Monday, December 28th. Welcome to the Just Baseball Show. I am Peter Apple, and I'm joined by Aram Layton. It is Twins Week. We're playing general manager. We're going to fix this Twins team. Did they finish 73-89 and in fifth place in the AL Central? Yes, but with our help and with our figurative money, we're going to save this team. But first, you're a Miami guy. After this podcast, you're headed to the local pub with your boys to watch Dolphins, Saints, and the Dolphins. All right, they've won six in a row. I get it. They're humming. We were just at Dolphins, Jets. We watched the game. The Jets almost beat them, but hey, they're there. And now they go face the Saints team who has none of their linebackers. Offensive line is trashed. They're starting Notre Dame rookie quarterback, Ian Book. Do the Dolphins cover three at home? Sounds and this like is going to come out after, storm. so people are going to have to yeah, I know. Hear this. I know. That's the best part. They know what happened. It's like when you're watching a TV show and you know that the killer is around the corner, except that the character doesn't. That's basically me right now. Like I'm ready to be killed uh, by the Dolphins in this season. And uh, you laid it out, right? Objectively speaking, the Dolphins should win. Objectively speaking, it should also be like minus seven. Like the, they're, they're actually playing the practice squad of the Saints and yeah. a, a co- college QB that wasn't even that great in college. He just accumulated a lot of stats. Like, oh, he's a good college All QB because right. he accumulated yeah. a bunch of stats over four years. Like, this is not, this is a joke. And, and that's what scares me. I, I think they're going to lose. I'm scared. I think they're going to lose. I'm glad you didn't touch the game with your picks. I'm glad you just went props because I'm terrified. But if the Dolphins win this game, you know, they play Tennessee on the road, which, you know, obviously Tennessee is the favorite, but like they could feasibly win that game, Maybe. especially with all the weapons out. And then they've got the Pats at home week 17 and the Dolphins always squeeze one out at home against or 18. Excuse me. The Dolphins always squeeze one out against the Pats at home. Like look at the last few years. I think that this is like the big trap though. And I think they lose this and I check out for the next two weeks. So if they're going to lose, just do it now. My thing is with the Dolphins, they started at plus three. And then with all the COVID news, now they're favored by a field goal. I just have a hard time going with the public because the public is all over the Dolphins. The Dolphins are the healthier team. They're on a six-game win streak. But the Saints are at home. A field goal. I just didn't want to touch the game because I the the Saints are not fielding the actual Saints. You're going to face the worst version, the most desecrated version of the New Orleans Saints, who haven't really proved anything to anyone either. They're also seven and seven. They came off a big win against the Bucks, nine to zero. So that's great. So I'm going with Alvin Kamara over 26 and a half receiving yards. I am pretty confident in that. I feel like the offensive lines are going to break down and it's going to be Ian Book just kind of running away, throwing little (laughs) passes to Alvin Kamara, just let him cook. But Nobody cares about that. Or maybe you do. But what you should care about more is the Minnesota Twins and how (laughs) we're going to fix them. And you just wrote an excellent article on JustBaseball.com labeled, The Minnesota Twins are quietly building a future contender. So we're going to talk about needs. We're going to talk about potential free agents they should sign, trade candidates. But first, you're telling me they're a future contender contender give me the short stuff and then we'll break into it more okay yeah i'll make my selling point real quick but that's before i get to that too it's so funny i I just want to say one thing reddit communities especially because i I dropped this this article over and this happens all the time i dropped this article over in twins reddit and all of the comments are like that's a funny way to say rebuilding or like, uh-huh. Oh yeah, I'll believe it. When I see it just miserable. And I get it. Like you're frustrated. Your team's not doing that great. Uh, and they had a really bad year, but it's so wild. You try to drop some positivity into these communities of teams that don't get a ton of love. And people are like, yeah, yeah. Right. Like whatever, bro. Like take it back where it came from. We only want misery over here. Uh, Reds fans aren't like that, but I'm hoping we find the twins fans that are more uh, rah, rah, but the Reddit group over there, they did not like, uh, the positive headline. <laughs> I understand why. I mean, their guys in the front office, front office, Derek Falvey and Thad Levine, they have been basically saying, we're going to try to improve this team. We're going to try to improve this team. And Twins fans just continue to hear that and then watch their team not mm-hmm. sign any big free agents. Yeah. I even posted on my Twitter at Peter Apple 23, by the way, <laughs> that Irvin Santana's that the Irvin Santana year, four years, 
54 million in 2015 was the largest for a starting pitcher in the history of their franchise. Isn't that crazy? We, we had the same thing with the, with the guardians too, where we were like, Oh my gosh, Edwin Encarnacion at like 50 million is the biggest deal they've ever given out to. Wow. Like you don't realize how much discrepancy there is between the small market and the big market. And then you see, wait, these, this team's never given out more than 50. Like that's a joke. I mean, the Marlins even just gave out 50 something uh, this past year to Avisael Garcia. Like how have you never given that out? Uh, but real quick to answer your question, the big thing that stands out to me is at least they've been making moves. All the trades that they've made have been for prospects that can help them in the next year or so. Like even mm -hmm. the Nelson Cruz deal, as I put out, pointed out in the article, they could have went with some upside raise prospects, right. That are in the lower levels, but Absolutely. instead they took advantage of a raise team that is very, very full on the 40 man roster. And they were looking to get rid of some of their 40 man arms and they got Joe Ryan out of that. And Joe Ryan looked really good last year. And that was just part of the roster crunch for the Rays. They were willing to overpay a little bit to clear up that, that 40 man spot and drew Strotman as well. I think that he's a, he's a legit rotation piece uh, is I, I think that they've got some pieces there. The pitching's the big question. But I love the bats in the outfield, too. If Buxton's healthy, big F, but you have to bet on that. And the two young guys in the corners, you got Larnick and, of course, Kirilov. Like, there's some interesting up offensive upside there. So that's kind of what I was looking at is a lot of young talent in the core there with control and then a ton of prospects who are kind of knocking on the door. How about Jose Miranda last year? I mean, the Jose guy was Miranda. the biggest it's actually breakout so good. prospect, I think, in baseball. He yeah, had 30 home talk, runs and hit like 340. Talk to me about Jose Miranda because he was one of the, not only the breakout prospect in the twin system, but one of the biggest breakout, breakout prospects in all of baseball. Yeah, dude. Like, I guess guy. he was a second round pick, but like he, he didn't do anything before that. And then all of a sudden he comes out and hits 30 jacks. 344, 401, 572 slash line between wow. double and triple A. And the only difference was he added about 10 to 15 pounds of muscle and really started focusing on lifting the baseball. And that was it. He had a super aggressive approach because he was an elite contact guy. And he's like, I'm going to swing at everything because I can hit everything. But as you know, Peter, like you played ball. There's one thing about, yes, I can hit that pitch. But do you want to go swing at a pitch that's on the edge? two and oh that you can't do that much with like no. two and oh you're keyhole in a spot right you're looking for and you're looking to do damage if it's not there you take the strike and that was the one thing that miranda really adjusted was he was just swing mode all the time he's still aggressive but he toned it down a lot it's just amazing how slight tweaks like that can be the difference between being kind of meh you know like a 100 wrc plus guy to hitting 344 between double and triple a uh, and that's a guy you got to be excited about like you got to believe that he did it in double and triple you there's a good chance he can about. contribute you yeah. have to be excited about a couple of guys like that, but I feel like at least Twins fans, because what they need the absolute most, starting, pitching, starting, pitching, starting, pitching. Yeah. And my thing is with the Twins is they have made some very questionable trades over the past few years in terms of just the pitching department. That doesn't even count the fact that they traded away Lamont Wade for Sean Anderson back in the day. I mean, what <laughs> hey, are you doing pitching. there? They're what? getting pitching. You're getting, You're getting pitching, I guess. Pitching. But look at this. You know how <laughs> I, I've, I've been talking up Luis Heel like a madman for the Yankees and how electric he is. The Yankees traded Jake Cobb for him. Jake Cave, however you say his last name. I think it's just Cave. Cave. It might be just Cave. Well, <laughs> Twins caved on that one because that was just not that great of a deal. Ooh. Ooh, good spin zone. Okay. But – the biggest one that I feel like Twins fans and Levine and these guys are definitely not too happy about, they traded away Huascar Yanoa yep. to the Atlanta Braves for Jaime Garcia and Anthony oh. Recker. Oh. Yeah. Those are yeah. just a couple moves we got to get back. And then their guy who they actually developed in Jose Barrios, it wasn't the fact that the Twins couldn't resign him, so it's not really to the fault of the Twins' front office, but the fact that he just straight up didn't want to stay, and now he just signed a seven-year, 150-ish million, 130, 140, doesn't Something matter to range. Twins fans. He's on the Blue Jays now, but they did lock up Byron Buxton, seven years, mm -hmm. $100 million. And I'm also thinking to myself, and we've talked about this before, even if he only plays like 75 games a year, that contract actually makes sense. 
Yeah, yeah. Not good of a player. A 171 OPS plus last year. This is one of the most dynamic players in baseball. So if you can get him for a full season, he's worth double that contract, maybe even triple because he's one of the most electric players in baseball. And I, at least Twins fans, I hope, can now sit back and be like, all right, we got one of the most electric guys. If he can just stay healthy, we can actually build around him. And that's probably why you see this team as a potential contender. Yeah, 100%. And, and I know they don't like to use the word rebuild, right? Like, I think you hit a lot of really important points there. You got to take chances, though, when you're retooling, whatever you want to call it. And they didn't even have to go outside of their org to take that chance, right? Trading Byron Buxton, you're not going to get the return that, that you really would change your franchise. But keeping Byron Buxton and hoping that he can stay healthy, I think, is the chance you have to take because that's like adding an MVP candidate, right? So I like it. I like the move. That's the chance you have to take. And we'll see if it pays off. But like you said, even if they manage his workload, give him a day off every week, and he finishes a season playing 120 games, but is available the entirety of the season, that's fine. Like, that's a win. That's and a I win. think that's something that we're probably going to see them do, right, is like that Giants approach with a lot of their older players, the way they manage the workloads of those guys, they all kind of finished around 500 plate appearances, give or take 50. And they made it through the whole season, except for Brandon Belt because of a fluke injury. Like that's probably the approach that I, we're going to see them take. And that might be the best way to go about it with Buxton because he's just too valuable. I, like you said, all those numbers are just insane. And that's your center fielder. That's a guy that's, that's the core guy. He's young and you're hoping that he can be around for a while. But what really surprised me when I looked at it, Peter, was the fact that, they have a pretty young core with control. They do. they do like and legit core. I mean, you look at the catching spot, right? You've got you've got Jeffers there, who I think well, is interesting. Hold on, right, before we even get to the catchers, let's let's continue on that outfield because they have Alex Kirloff, Trevor Larnick. They have a lot of guys in that outfield that, if you're looking yeah. to platoon, move guys around. Maybe Max Kepler leaves. What do they do with him? They have a lot of twenty-something year olds in this mm-hmm. outfield. So, what would you do with that outfield at this point? Yeah, I love that question because obviously <laughs> I Buxton's do. in center. You wrote about the article. <laughs> <laughs> like Buxton's in center, right? And and partly I'm like trade Max Kepler. And, and I think to your Yankees, it wouldn't be a bad move. He's a great Not defender. Uh, but I also think about him like, what did we just talk about 10 seconds ago? Byron Buxton getting a lot of days off. Mm-hmm. So Kepler could play center and you're getting a lot of days off. But a, a three, an outfield of three left-handed hitters is kind of nuts uh, yeah. because – I'm expecting Warnick to start. I'm even more so expecting Kirilov to start. That's one of my big, big breakout guys for next year. He was hampered by injury uh, for a lot of the season, but has unreal bat-to-ball skills, sneaky power. He's just a good all-around player. Like That's what I want to roll with is those three guys because Warnick leaves a little bit to be desired in the outfield. Kirilov's okay, but then you have probably the best defensive center fielder when healthy in baseball and maybe one of the best ever when he's really tracking the ball down. That kind of makes up for it. So that, that's the really important thing there is if Buxton's healthy, then I'm okay with those corner guys. If he's not healthy, you got to kind of reevaluate things. And that's why it's really important, I, I think, to have that depth of Kepler. But also, that's a very valuable asset that you're just holding on to there that's more expensive than a lot of guys on the roster. And that's why I'm like, maybe you roll the dice and trade him and just go kind of look for another depth outfield piece. Brent Rooker isn't really good out there either, mm. but that could be a depth piece. I don't love him. Uh, But that's probably what I'm rolling with is that trio. And you got a tough decision to make with what you're going to do with the fourth. But I think Warnick and Kirilov can be can be legit uh, above average to all star type players. I want to run this by you because when I was reading your article, I thought, yeah, Max Kepler actually probably would be a good trade piece. But if the twins are really looking to compete. Would you consider trading possibly Kirilov or Larnick? in a deal for one of these starting pitchers because we know that they have the outfield depth. Like we know that they're already there. I don't like, is Alex Kirloff a guy who is going to change their franchise and someone they absolutely need to keep. And then is totally untradeable Trevor Larnick. I mean, I was even a year early on Alex Kirloff. I thought he was going to win, win rookie of the year this year. He was one of my dark horse. I think I put 10 bucks on it. I think I put 10 bucks on that. (laughs) But, but then when I, when I watched him, I see the potential, but I don't see him as a guy who, to me, I'm like, all right, this is going to be the guy who we build around. Buxton yeah. kind of seems like the guy that you're oh, obviously yeah. going to build around. And I know Kirloff and Larnick are younger, but would, would you consider possibly trading Kirloff maybe in a deal for a Tyler Molly or something like that? I forget. We just went over this. Is it Molly or Molly? We just went over it with Clay Snowden in our, in our Reds episode. You forget to. I forgot Molly. Let's go with Molly. <laughs> Let's go with Molly. 
<laughs> no, Mally. Um, it has to be Mally. It's Mally. Mally. You, you just you just remembered. Okay. I think it's yeah. Mally. I, I, it makes me not want to talk about it. <laughs> I know I it's scary every time. Uh, but no, no, I think it's a really interesting question. I'd probably be more willing to trade Larnick, uh, just because Larnick comes but with so some swing the and miss. But yeah, you know, you know? I, what? Wait, what'd you <laughs> I'd say? I'd say so with the twins. Like, I, oh, I, yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying yeah. Kirloff. Like, would you stake Ooh. the claim and be like, I'm okay trading him if I can get a young, controllable starting pitcher, which they need? Yeah, you know, it, it, I think Kepler makes it a little bit more palatable. The only thing is that then you have swing and miss guy Kepler. I know Buxton's improved a lot, but swing and miss guy in Buxton to a degree, and then swing and miss guy in Larnick. Yeah. It's a little concerning, but, but without even going straight into that, like I think it's a really good question. And it would have to be the perfect scenario. Like I would only do that in a package for maybe a Luis Castillo or a package for an even more controllable arm. Cause you have to remember that this is a twin team that's kind of operating on years of control. So they love the fact that Kirilov is, is under control for however many years, right? Yeah. Maybe they trade for a big league ready prospect. Like mm. you look at, you know, a big league ready arm, uh, pitching prospect arm. That could be something that that is intriguing, but I think it also depends on how much confidence they have in like Jordan Belazovic and Joel Duran and Joe Ryan and, and all of these guys, Simeon Woods Richardson. I know they're a little bit further off, but yeah, like if they want to go for it this year, you could do it. I think that they could deal Larnick. I don't think it's crazy to imagine they could deal Larnick. I just think Killeroff, like you said it, he's not going to be an MVP candidate, but I think you know what you're getting there. And he's for sure a good big leaguer. And I think and the high end will make some all-star games, whereas Larnick, insane power, but you don't know if he's going to put it all together. I'd want to kind of expel a little bit of that risk as you already have the risk in center with Buxton, but that might be hard to do. Uh, and, and that's the thing though, is like, how else do you retool? Uh, and that's where we're, I'm kind of excited to get into that. And let's also, before we get into the retooling, before we kind of build, uh, break it all down, uh, let's celebrate a couple bright spots with the Minnesota twins. Jorge Polanco rakes. Yeah. He rakes. He's one of the better shortstops in baseball and deserves a lot of credit. And we're talking about a lot of, you know, we'll talk about later prospects, the guy like Royce Lewis, who they drafted first overall, um, even Alex Martin is a guy who could potentially play first base, but probably not, or not first base, excuse me, play shortstop, but he's m- most likely going to move over to second base, maybe an outfield spot. But Jorge Polanco kind of looks like, you know, their shortstop of the future. Is he that great a defender? No, but the dude rakes. And then another guy who we've just been, or you guys mostly have, I like him, but you guys like him a lot more. Mitch Garver, another <laughs> catcher who quite honestly, you showed him in his last 680 plate appearances. I don't know if you have that stat on you, but he also kind of breaks. Yeah, he had an – that, wasn't that a crazy stat? Yeah, it really was. <laughs> I, I have it right here. Hold on. I'm pulling it up. But, like, See, I Garver like him. Swing I liked him, healthy. but seeing that from you, I was like, ah, oh, shit, maybe I'm, maybe I'm behind on Mitch Garver a little bit. Honestly, dude, like, I was like, oh, yeah, he's good. I didn't realize how – how many home runs he was hitting in so few ABs, yeah. right? I didn't realize, I knew he hit 30, 31 or whatever uh, a couple of years ago, but I didn't know that was in 93 games. Like that's crazy. That's so in his crazy. last 680 plate appearances, which is a season for a lot of guys, obviously not for a catcher, 256, 350, 549 slash line, 46 bombs. I mean, that's nuts. It's Salvador <laughs> that's Salvador Perez if he walked and played good yeah. defense. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is a guy like Salvador Perez plays every single day and a guy like Mitch Garver plays half the game. So how do you truly evaluate that? How do you quantify the consistency of a catcher sitting behind home plate and calling the game? How do you quantify that over a long stretch of time, that consistency for a pitching staff when they're continually switching off between Garver and Jeffers, who you seem to like a bit more than maybe a lot of people even know who that is. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've been in on uh, Jeffers has been a guy I've been writing up for a while that I just always liked. Yeah, the offensive numbers weren't great last year and he struck out like 36% of the time. But imagine you're a 24 year old that gets thrown into handling an entire pitching staff. And then you got to worry about that hitting thing too at at the big league level. He showed power. He was really good defensively. Uh, The only like little hole in his game is is throwing runners out, as I mentioned in the article, but that's become more and more of a lost start anyways, is base Mm -hmm. stealing that is. But when you look at catcher's defensive adjustment, which takes into account everything from blocking, framing, throwing guys out, whatever you name it, it's a baseball prospectus stat. I believe he slotted in right around like the top 11 or 12 in baseball, which is great for a 24-year-old. 
I think that they platoon it there. You keep Garver healthy because he's a guy that keeps getting banged up too. Some of it's fluky injuries. I would love to see Garver in the lineup as much as possible, though, just without him being behind the dish. Like, do you put maybe Garver at first base sometimes? Do you DH him sometimes? He can't be worse at first, Peter, than Miguel Sano. I'm better at first than Miguel Sano. Yeah, not only are you better defensively at first base, but even offensively. I mean, the guy hits for a lot of power. There's no doubt about it. He hit 30 home runs last year, 24 doubles. But he doesn't really walk. He only hit 223. He struck out 183 times in 470 at bats. Is that a guy that we're staking our claim on and be like, yes, at first be there when if Jeffers can be a solid defender and Mitch Garver is a better hitter, when is it time to finally move off of Miguel Sano and his 35% strikeout rate? Yeah. Right. Like I think that's a great question because yeah, like Sano has this power that is unbelievable, but Garver is hitting just as many home runs. Right, like it's when like, Garver's on the field, and it's like thirty. I mean, he's hit, he's hit or miss. It's 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 going to go out or it's going to not. Like, how many home runs was that to take the lead? How many home, game winning home runs was that? Or was that a lot of home runs when it's eight to three in the fifth inning and Miguel Sano just hit a solo home run? Because it's not like he drove he drove in that many RBIs. No, I'm genuinely curious because of of course I didn't I wasn't able to watch the Twins every single day. But when you talk to a Twins fan, they'll probably like get out of here, Miguel Sano. You strike out too much. I can't watch this anymore. Yeah, I, I, I really don't see it. Um, I just don't think anybody wants to take the contract on, you know, like that that's the problem. So you're kind of just stuck with him. But I'd be cool with, I'd rather see Garver get more ABs. Like you can still play Sano plenty and he's still going to get his at-bats. But like, let me see a little bit more Garver in the lineup. Gar, Garver won't hit the ball 136 miles an hour, but it all counts the same when it goes over the wall. And, you know, that that's something that, Garver has a better chance to do more frequently because he makes more contact. Like at a certain point that matters. Right. And, and I think that's something that I would like to see a little bit more of. And, and by the way, to answer your question, Peter, 196 with runners in scoring position uh, this past year with eight homers, a 695 OPS. Uh, so, so not great, not great at all. Late and close 169 <laughs> batting average as well. I love, I love, I don't even need to know the stats. No, it's like a general knowledge of probably what Miguel Sano is doing. <laughs> like, yeah, the, the only guy that defies that is Akil Badu, who hits like 400 late and close last year. <laughs> he, he's the Just clutch freak, clutch freak show. But yeah, yeah, that's like if a pitcher sees Sano at the plate and is like, okay, I have to get this guy. I have to execute some pitches. They're going to execute some pitches and get him. It's when it's like the middle reliever, like you said, in a blowout game that comes in and he's like, all right, like here's the fastball, hum it in there, and Sano crushes one and adds it to the stat line. I mean, it seems like Sano is turning into a three true outcome guy without one of the good outcomes. <laughs> Not walking, just home run or strike out. The two bad outcomes, or one good outcome and then a bad one. Yeah, he's like a two true outcome guy, I guess. <laughs> a 50 50 a coin. Because at least Gallo, like he flip. walks. He walks a ton. He walks yeah. an absolute ton. And he's just and then he Sano provides that flip. incredible value on defense. Miguel Sano actually doesn't do any of those things besides hit home runs. Yep. Yeah, I'm out. So get Garver some more ABs. That's that's kind of my thing. They need to know about their starting pitchers yep. uh, in, in the farm. Because right now, when we're looking at this rotation as currently constructed, well, I'll read you the 2021 rotation, and then we'll decide where some other guys are probably going to slot in. So they started the year with Jose Barrios at the one, Michael Pineda at the two, who is currently a free agent, who I think they actually really need to re-sign. He had a 3.62 yeah. ERA, which is very solid, 4-2-1 FIP. Is he going to repeat that next year? Uh, we'll see. But still, he wants to come back to Minnesota, and he's a starting pitcher. That's already a plus for Minnesota. Kenta Maeda. Oh, gosh. I mean, dude, four six six ERA. He just straight up didn't perform. His stuff looked almost non-existent at times. I remember watching Pineda or Pineda Maeda outings and just being like, "This just doesn't look like the guy who was on the Dodgers." Yeah, and I then, think it was the arm, man. I really think it was his arm was gone. So we'll see when he comes back. Yeah. I mean, he might not even be back this year. So it's like you're hoping he comes back second half, but. 
I remember we were having that early season discussion yeah. where you were like Scherzer and, and Colby was so bullish on Maeda that Colby's like, I'll oh, take Maeda over Scherzer. And we're like, whoa. Uh, I made Colby okay. answer for that on our breakout pitchers pod. I was like, I need you to answer for that because that was never publicly answered. That was way back at the beginning when we were project the plate. And I was like, that's one of the worst takes of all time, Colby. Yeah, and he usually has good ones, but that was. You know, but he can hide suspect. behind the slight veil of like he was pitching hurt wait till he comes back. But, but that aside, I mean, even Maeda at what he was last year would be helpful to this rotation. Like that's how unknown this rotation is. I would take a four ERA guy in two seconds in the back end. I think Maeda's is going to come back stronger. I really do believe that a big part of why he was struggling was probably the elbow, right? I mean, yeah, like he was pitching yeah. through some issues. I'm not saying he's going to be Dodgers Maeda, but he's got to be a little bit better it's not a coincidence that the injury came shortly after his stuff was like you said, just not passing the eye test. I agree. And when I'm thinking about that, and when you say stronger, like at this point in 2021, what he gave us, it's hard to not considering, but I'm, I'm curious to see what that stronger actually quantifies as, is he going to be a guy routinely now back in the threes, ERAs in the threes in the FIP, or is he just going to be a low fours guy who gets you through some innings and, is more of a three or a four in a rotation or can Kenta Maeda get back that. to that frontline starter? Yeah, we're probably looking at that as he tails off in his career. And then you go farther down in the rotation, dude. I mean, Jay Happ was the four starter, him and his six, seven, seven ERA. And I don't even know where he's at these days. <laughs> we know he played for the Cardinals in a couple different teams, but you know, we'll, we'll see. I don't think the twins are looking to reside Jay Happ. Bailey Ober, uh, tall. You say he's got, he's got a good post game. I don't know how he can pitch, you know, 419 ERA last year, 459 FIP. You know, I mean, tall. That's a fine, that's a fine, and that's a fine like four or five, right? Like he's 25. He could get a little bit better. You want your four or five stars to be tall. So tall. they have that locked in. Griffin Jacks. No, uh, 6370 ERA. I mean, yeah, what, I, what, what what do you want me to say? I they they're gonna give him a shot too. Like they the will thing. give him a shot because right now, as constructed. Out of all of those names and why I wanted to name them is only Bailey Ober remains. Yeah. From the start of 2021. You mentioned Joe Ryan. I like Joe Ryan a lot. I'm excited about him. That's it. Thank goodness they made that trade. Like, imagine if they didn't get Joe Ryan. Like, what the, the other guy that's going to be thrown into the mix here, who was like kind of a guy that I think we faded a lot last year, was, <laughs> was John Gant. I think that's who came over in the J Hap trade. I didn't even mention him in the article. And I was thinking about it. I was like, yeah, I guess John Gant's going to get a shot, right? But I, 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 that's that's great. Wait, no, I think he left. Did he depart? Did Was John Gant like a rental? Well, how about I'll give you another one. They did sign Dylan Bundy Googling to a one-year, $5 million deal. So we got Dylan Bundy and his 607 ERA last year, career 472 ERA guy. I haven't heard of the twins being really able to turn careers around like that. Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I hope he goes and is vintage Dylan Bundy. That's not even sarcastic. I truly hope that. I mean, that would be fantastic for the twins. Slightly sarcastic because I, I don't know how any team could actually turn around Dylan Bundy, but I'm hoping it for the twins. You know, you know where John Gantz is? is already interrupt. You know where John Gantz is now? <laughs> Cardinals triple A? The Haikido Nippon Ham Fighters. Dang it, John Gant. The Twins the needed you this year. <laughs> I was about to say this guy's getting in the rotation, and instead he's getting in a rotation in the other side of the world. Is he even, like, <laughs> at the front of their rotation on the other side of the world? No, he's, like, their three. Like the four. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, so all that to say, the pitching, they got some answers they need. They got some answers that, that they need to find. Okay, um, let's find their answers first. Yeah. They don't have a lefty. You say no. Kikuchi. Why not? Go get him. I agree. Go get I him. Like, Go get him like right that. now. Because if you're looking at the top 15-ish starting pitchers uh, of the free agents, 13 of 15 are signed. And the only ones available are Carlos Rodon, who they actually did give a qualifying, or they gave a minor league contract to before he signed that deal with the White Sox. So they had interest in him at least initially but now i'm thinking if they only offered him that kind of deal are they gonna go full in now with carlos rodon i don't know if that's changed maybe risk believe in them it's a lot of risk especially for a team like the twins but the twins have only have only when we're looking forward to 2022 
their payroll is supposed to be at $45 million. And that's about half of what it, of what their average most likely is season to season, around $90 million. So they have money to spend. So why mm-hmm. not go Carlos Rodon and Yusei Kikuchi? Build out the rest of that rotation with some lefties. I know I just said Carlos Rodon might not be a possibility, but it seems like Yusei Kikuchi might. You like that? I like Kikuchi a lot. I like it a lot. I think this was a, I think that's a great name because you can buy a little bit low here. He was streaky. I, he was definitely streaky last year, but I mean, he was still solid. He was really good in the first half, faded a bit in the second half. And I thought he showed some signs again at the end. That's a guy though. You're still at worst, you know, you're getting a fours ERA guy who's going to strike out a bunch of dudes. And I think he's going to continue to get better. I really do. If you look at some of the whiff rates on his offerings, like he's got a lot going for him. He's got a lot of, uh, positives to his arsenal and to just the quality of his stuff that's a guy i'm taking a flyer on and like you said they need a lefty the pay the, they're going to be so cheap next year that you could give him a lower end deal this year in terms of, of money but he will be able to get maybe a three-year deal that nobody else would offer and you can backload it a little bit i would do that in two seconds i i think that's a perfect name uh, for them to go get and he makes them instantly a lot better uh, I would love to see, I would love to see a move like that. And then like throw in somebody else, right? Like you bring back Pineda, but if you, if you can't do that, like you take a flyer on another vet, like Zach Davies or hell, maybe Zach Granke, who cares? <laughs> throw Why him in not the mix. Zach Granke? They just That's need a guys that can eat innings. Yeah, I would love it. And that they hold it down until some of those excited, they have prospects. Like they their do. system is riddled with arms. It's just a little, they're a little bit further off. Get yourself some rentals in the meantime. And at least Kikuchi, you could put into the future too. Like that guy could be a piece of your rotation two years from now. And we know that the twins have solid offensive prospects, but if we're looking at the starting pitching, because it's the area that I want to focus on the most to try and improve this twins team, because we know that they can hit. They were in the same competitions with the Yankees for these home run records year over year. They've made the playoffs three out of the last five years on the backs of that offense. So if they can just put together some sort of rotation, this is actually a team that can make it. When you consider also the fact that the AL Central is not a division that some team has an absolute stranglehold over. You could argue the White Sox are really good, but I think their rotation is going to take a step back. Hopefully, I mean, Luis Robert could win an MVP if he stays healthy, but let's see him stay healthy for an entire year. You know, they got a lot of moving parts. Aloy Jimenez, another guy, is he going to stay healthy all year? So this is not set in stone that the Chicago White Sox are absolutely going to run away with the division. Is there anybody in their farm system on the pitching side who's close and can make an impact this year? Yeah, you know, there's a few guys. Obviously, we mentioned Joe Ryan, who's going to be up there. Uh, but that's the question I was going to I was going to ask you a similar question. I was going to say, <laughs> do you want to wait a year and see where these prospects are at? Or do you go get a guy now and not roll the dice on all of these prospects? Because when you look at the, at the guys that they have in the system, I actually really like a couple of the arms. Simeon Woods Richardson, the numbers in double A are a little shaky. He was the youngest player in all of double A and even holding his own at times and still getting swings and misses, I think he's going to be a stud. I think he's going to be a stud. He was the youngest dude in double A, which as a pitcher, that's really tough. Really tough. And looks really good towards the end. I I think he's probably a year and change off. Uh, You look at some of the other pieces, that's where it's like, okay, are you, is it worth waiting? Like they have a bunch of quadruple A types that could take that next step. I'm not counting on those guys. So to answer your question, really, it's going to be probably a year until we see most of these guys yeah. uh, really come in here. Jordan Belazovic is the one guy that I think could be ready to go next year. He's an interesting, he's a top 100 guy on our top, on our list. And uh, not quite the explosive year I thought he'd have, still a really solid year. And he's got good command. I think he's probably the guy that could be up by by next season, by the mid, midway point. And then Jawan Duran, who is someone that's nasty stuff, but had an elbow strain last year. Those always get you a little nervous. Uh, he was up in AAA, so he could be up. I'm looking at Duran and Belazovic, but Duran's got the elbow issues. Belazovic is the guy that I think could slot in and help them uh, as soon as like the middle of next year. 
as much as I'm trying to build them up for 2022, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. 2023 seems like the year. And maybe yeah, you wait right. out a Chicago White Sox year. Maybe you wait out another Royals year, Guardians, see if they go for it. And then 2023, 2024 is really your time to shine. I just know Twins fans don't want to wait for that. But yes you know. and no, I, I think that's better than a lot of people thought, though, right? Like everyone's yes. saying, all these people in this Reddit forum are saying, like, rebuild, rebuild, rebuild. And that's why I opened with like the fact that Falvey said, I'm not using the word rebuild. And we always hear GM speak, but I think a lot of the moves that they've made kind of back that up, right? Like you trade Jose Barrios instead of getting a platter of four youngsters. They got Austin Martin, who's knocking on the door, right? He, he already was hitting well in double A and really Simeon Woods Richardson, who was the youngest player in double A. You got two guys close to big league ready. We talked about the trade with the Rays, two 40 man arms already. Like a lot of the moves that they're making are implying that they're looking at 2023. And usually when you hear rebuild, you're looking like three, four years down the road. That's why they're not calling it a rebuild. I'm calling it like almost like a renovation. And that's why I think 2023 is a really good target date. I know they probably want to say we'll be competitive tomorrow or next year, but I think they're going to be a lot more fun to watch next year, Peter. Like, I think I'm going to enjoy watching this team play as long as everybody's healthy. This is a pretty interesting team. I, I know we're going to be taking the overs. Oh, yeah. I can tell you that, but uh, I think they'll be fun to watch. This offense remains fun to watch. And they're actually, they were a pretty good team defensively. They finished in the top. They finished 13th and outs above average in defensive run save. They were in the, in the upper half. This is not that bad of a team. It just always comes back to the starting pitching, but let's talk about two of their top prospects. And I realized uh, the reason, another reason why I want to talk about them is because I messed up his name again. It's not Alex Martin. It's Austin Martin, <laughs> Austin Martin and Royce Lewis. So Austin Martin came over in that Jose Barrios trade with Simeon Woods Richardson and Royce Lewis was picked number one overall by the twins in 2017 before he tore his ACL. But I think Aram, even before he tore his ACL, you had some pretty strong opinions on him and you've also had some strong opinions on Austin Martin. And I love calling you out in the middle of these podcasts because you have that big smile and because you know that we've had these conversations. So yeah. give us give us the lowdown. You know, it's so funny, man. I just had a flashback where I'm sitting right now when we were doing our first YouTube videos ever. Um, we were doing top 10 shortstop prospects and you're like, Did Royce Lewis that low? And I gave you like my whole lowdown on, on why I was skeptical. And that was obviously before the ACL. Uh, so it, yeah, Royce Lewis is insane athletically right insane, insane athletically but i just really don't like the swing like that that was that was all it was maybe he'll come out with a much more toned down swing because his, his body was just banged up but like he wasn't even a great defensive shortstop he had a ton of swing and miss ton of ground balls and i'm just like okay there's so many questions here for this guy like what we're just betting on athleticism and that's it right like he, he's not doing it that great defensively he's not doing that great offensively he doesn't walk uh, the power hasn't totally made its way out. High ground ball rate, high strikeout rate. I'm just like, eh, you, like that. Look, there's too many questions. So, I mean, look, I, I want to see how he comes back when he puts it together. If he puts it together, he could be in incredibly dynamic. And even though it feels like he's been around forever, he's still only 22. So the fact that he's still only 22, he's got time on his side, uh, but there's just too many moving parts to that swing. And until he tones it down, I think he's going to have you know a lot of trouble having success. Uh, but any day you have the kind of athlete with some of the ridiculous twitchy athleticism that he has, you can't rule that guy out. Austin Martin on the flip side is kind of almost the, the opposite of, of Royce Lewis. Mm -hmm. Like he has a very limited ceiling in my eyes, but he is a big leaguer, right? Like that, yeah. that guy could be a solid second baseman in the big leagues for a long time. Uh, and that's why I think Johnson India comps. End up. Get yeah, some Jonathan that, India comps. That's what I was saying. Like you're, you're hoping for John India and that would be great. Uh, if it works out that way, you know, I, I that's what I kind of see because his instincts are incredible. Uh, he has unbelievable ability to just hit the baseball, right? Like, like that is undeniable. What my big issue with him was like how high he was relative to where I think he should be. I mean, you look at where he ranks, he's top 20 everywhere. Top oh, yeah. 20 prospect. Oh yeah. And, and I, I think he's a top 100 guy. Like he, he's a good prospect. He can hit, he walks, he's got instincts, but for a guy to be a top 100 guy, that at least is one of the things I'm looking at. But to be a top 20 guy, you've got to have all-star projectability. 
I don't think Austin Martin does, right? He's a slightly above average runner. He has no position right now. He has below average power. You're really betting on a hit tool and an ability to get on base, which I think will translate, but that's not an all-star. That's just not an all-star to me. Uh, so, so that's kind of why I'm a little bit lower on him, but he could be up in the big leagues next year and play second base and be a, a solid defensive second baseman. So that, that is worth something. I totally agree. And I think the top 20 versus the top 100 is solely based on that hit tool. How do you evaluate him as a hitter? Do you project 20 to 25 home run power? Do you project 10 to 15 home run power? Do you, do you project a 300 hitter? Do you project a 270 type hitter? All of these questions we're going to see. And even a guy like Jonathan India who came out, he was not on the absolute precipice of these top prospects rankings, but it was his ability to hit. And I actually do. I agree with you, Royce Lewis. I'm actually a little bit higher after watching more of Austin Martin at the plate. And after talking with Dustin too, the words I keep hearing are professional hitter. Oh yeah. Professional hitter. So if I'm hearing that in the lower levels already, and I know he's got his head on straight. I know he's just a gamer. That's another word that I continue to hear out of Austin Martin camps. That bodes well for me. And I'm confident that he can at least be a very solid two, maybe even an all-star caliber hitter. And then if he can provide value across the diamond, could you even see a potential Jake Cronenworth come out from an Austin Martin? Or do you think Cronenworth and Austin Martin, you're like, well, the Crone zone's just a little bit better. I think Crone's got more power. You know, like I mm. that's the big thing that holds me back is like, I think everything you said is right. I mean, the more the more digging I do on Martin and the more I watch, you realize how he's one of those guys that you have to watch a lot of to yeah. see what he can do. And that's, that's why I love you know, watching him at the futures game. you got to watch really, so many at bats. Yeah. Yeah. And, and cause then you see like, Oh, okay. Like this guy makes adjustments in at bats. This guy doesn't chase this guy, you know, builds off of each AB. And, and that's something that you can't really teach. Martin has that. And that's why for me, he's can't miss top 100. Uh, the ceiling is where I just, I just don't Hard. see like, can he impact the baseball with enough violence to, to be a 20 home run guy? I don't think so. So if he's 10 to 15 home runs and he's hitting 285 and getting on base at a 350 clip, like that's a good big leaguer, 360 clip even, he might even beat that. I think it's going to be really dependent on for him is the ability to get on base. How much mm -hmm. is this guy walking? How much, because I know he's going to hit. We, we both know he's going to hit. How much is he walking? Is that going to translate to the big league level? And where the hell is he playing defense? He's not playing shortstop, not yeah. enough power to play third. Is he quick enough for center field? Or is he going to end up at second base? Because if he ends up at second base, how many second basemen are top prospects? Like you got to be like Nick York, that yeah. type. You got to be Nick Gonzalez. Yeah. And I don't think he's Those got that kind of upside. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't, but he's maybe, interesting. Maybe could the upside be greater because you can slot him in at any position that you choose. That could be where the value is just better for him. Because it's not like, I mean, even a guy like, I'm not, I'm not going to compare him to Ben Zobris because Ben Zobris is a legend, but Ben Zobris was not a guy a hitting you 30 home runs a year. No, like he was always in the 15 to 20, always a 280, 360 guy, you know, maybe slug 450, 460, who just plays at different positions and it's just an impact in the lineup whenever you get him. Couldn't Austin Martin look like that? And then on that Twins team, when we're talking about platoons, talking about a lot of swing and miss guys, he actually could be extremely valuable, especially for the Minnesota twins. And that's why I felt like in that trade with, with the blue Jays that they thought, all right, this feels like a perfect twin, not just a really good prospect, but a really good twin. And we need him especially. Well, one thing I will say to piggyback off of that is I think he's an upgrade over Arias. So that's a big Arias, thing too, right? Arias is crazy. Is he makes big dumb contact. Every, no, a dummy isn't contact. good. Like, crazy about the contact but two home runs that's true. yeah martin's gonna hit a ton of doubles i think and that's gonna yeah. really dictate his ceiling too right how many doubles are you hitting how many gappers Absolutely. are you spending? they clearly i think see him as as i'm guessing second baseman of the future and if that's the case he's an upgrade over arias to kind of give you what, what i think where he's going to be like he's better than that and arias can be that super utility guy and let martin kind of stay in one spot or you know move to third second ish i don't know like maybe shortstop in a pinch uh, but yeah, if he can play all over, then you, you've got some value there too. But I think he's an upgrade over Arias. And then you can side Arias in the utility role. This is a team that's just really balanced across the board, right? Like Martin's going to help them. That, that I'm, I'm, I don't debate whatsoever. 
but you know, who, who knows, maybe he start pulls out a little bit more than I think he's capable of, but if you, if you hit three thirty, then it doesn't matter how much power you hit for, right? Like, so if, if he's able to do something like that, then, then we've got another story, but I think they need some more guys like that because of how many other upside big time power guys they have. So I, I like it. And before we go into the twins, just a little bit more, I was just looking back at the 2017 draft. Aram, why did they go Royce Lewis? Because when you look at the draft, Hunter Green went number two, who we just went over on the Reds episode, is looking like a potential frontline starter. I mean, he's got to work on that on on his offering on his secondary offerings. Yeah, but, but like I mean, we know he's going to be a good pitcher regardless. Wherever he is, he's going to be awesome. And then I know Mackenzie Gore has had his struggles, but it was Mackenzie Gore. Yeah. And then, I mean, you got Brendan McKay. Maybe you wouldn't have gone him, but we just saw Kyle Wright in the playoffs. You know, you move down. I mean, even if you wanted to go with a hitter, Paven Smith out of Kessinger, Joe Adele, Trevor Rogers to the Miami Marlins for the 13th overall pick. Kind of a shitty draft. I mean, yeah, not the best draft. I mean, no, but I mean, we may be surprised. I mean, Mackenzie yeah. Gore comes back and proves that he's Mackenzie Gore again. If Hunter Green becomes that frontline starter, we know Paven Smith, right? Like, there's a lot of guys. Rogers is like. just done. Rogers yeah. could win a Cy Young one day, according to you. <laughs> well, well, I think Colby, too, according to Colby soon, too. That's true. Well, to Colby answer your him. question, they did. I'm, I'm fairly positive. I don't quite remember, but they might have done the old underslot first overall pick thing which didn't work out well with Mickey Moniak. It's going to work with Henry Davis because you and I agreed that Henry Davis was the number one overall caliber Ricks. pick anyways. I think they did the underslot first overall pick thing with Royce Lewis, which to me is just why you have the first pick, take the best player. Everybody covets the first pick. Don't underslot. And don't I don't think Royce it. Lewis, even at the time was the number one rated prospect in that class. You don't think, or, or you do think? No, I don't, I don't think, think he was. No, I'm, I'm almost positive. He wasn't, um, which is, which is like, yeah, they went underslot. They did the classic number one overall pick under slot move, which I think is so crazy. I take the dude, either. like take you have the guy. The number one pick. You don't get the number one pick that often. Could have like, been Hunter Green. Or even Gore. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Maybe Gore goes somewhere else besides San Diego and another, I, I don't know. But yeah, that, that is a fun, that is a, we got to do some, some draft recaps if, if this, uh, if this lockout gets too too dragged out, we should definitely do some uh, some look backs at some drafts. We'll probably be mind blown with some of them. Oh yeah. So when we're considering the twins as a whole, what I think they should do is you should give a decent sized deal to Yusei Kikuchi. What kind of deal would you give to Yusei Kikuchi? I'm thinking like if you can get him for three years at around fifteen per. I think a three-year, yeah. forty-five deal for Kikuchi makes a lot of sense. It's not absolutely going to break the bank, and it's no. they have money to spend. As I mentioned earlier, they only have forty-five million dollars in committed payroll this year, and normally they're between forty-five to or not forty-five. They're between ninety million. That's on average, and that's just that's when they're middle of the pack. That's not even when they're going out and spending a ton. You could give Rodon. Why not give Rodon more money? You are the Minnesota Twins. You got to spend money on pitching. That's your hole. Go do it. What's stopping you? You got the money. I, I'm missing something. And the White Sox lose them and you get them. I mean, there's there's a little bit of issue. You he know, knows the, the White Sox. I'm, yeah. And that's that's the one thing. I, I think that you, you have to, like you said, you have to make that signing. I don't know if they're going to do it this year or next year. Because remember, also 21 million coming off the books annually from Josh Donaldson. He's I think he makes 21 this year, 21 next year. Club option for the third year, which they'll inevitably decline, even though he's playing pretty good baseball right now. Could rake. He, he he's does a rake. good player. He's a good player. You know, he's still a valuable player. Yeah. Uh, but you have that money clear up. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at, at either Kikuchi or they might just want to reassess the free agent class next year. You know, yeah. what are the what do the arms look like next year uh, that are available? Because like you said, I think the one thing that we kind of really settled on in this conversation is that. They're going to be better next year. I really think they will be, but there's no sense in like going for it next year. The more we talked about it, I was like, 2023 is an attainable opportunity to go for it because you'll have a good idea of what Larnick looks like, what Kirilov looks like. Is Buxton finally able to stay healthy? Uh, you're clearing up money, as you mentioned. Is Jeffers ready to take the, the first base role 
you know, or excuse me, the catcher role for the foreseeable future. Did Joe Ryan emerge? Is Bailey Ober more than just a six foot nine guy? Tall. Like, are, are some of these guys, is Maeda a piece now that can actually pitch moving forward? Like you're able to answer all of those questions, hopefully this year, then go, you know, next year and, and really decide that would probably be the, the best way to go about it. So what would you trade Max Kepler? Or do you hold him one more year? I think I'm going to, uh, I'd see what I can get. Yeah. Obviously like I'm putting them out on the trade block. I'm seeing what teams are looking like. If, if, if someone will trade me a starting pitcher, at least a decent one, I'm definitely pulling the, pulling the trigger. But if I'm not getting a starting pitcher that I like, then I'm just going to keep him and wait till next year because we know most likely Byron Buxton will deal with some injuries this year. Yeah. Probably going to need Max Kepler. And, you know, we hope that Larnick and Kirloff and all these guys stay healthy, but to have those on the back, you're most likely going to need him. Then maybe let's say Buxton puts up a really healthy year. Maybe he makes, I, I don't know, like there's some stuff in the off season and he figures something out and he plays 150 games and he's moving forward. I remember you could, with Aaron judge is another example of a guy who stayed healthy all year after he's been dealing with the injury bug. Some guys, sometimes guys just find things in their routine that allows them to stay healthy. They're able now to adjust to a 162 game schedule. So I would keep Max Kepler for now, unless they're going to overpay with a starting pitcher. And if not, I'm just going to roll with it and wait for 2023. I think we're in a good spot with the twins. Do you agree? Yeah, and I think if you if you hold on to Kepler, let's say he rakes this year, and then at the deadline you you ship him out. A team like the Yankees or a team like the Red Sox or somebody else that really needs an outfield bat uh, because of you know, injuries of their own, you could probably get a, a hungry slash a little bit desperate team to Absolutely. to give up a good arm to give up a good arm there that you can add to the fold. So I agree. I think you hold Kepler. You'll probably have a better gauge midway through the season. We both agree the arms are the big question. But you could probably wait another year before dramatically addressing it. If they do that, they better address it, right? Like they better yes. spend some money. Because if you trade, remember, if you trade Kepler, that's another $8 million cleared up. So you have a lot of, of freedom financially, potentially. Go make a splash or two on a pitcher. And your young core is controllable and cheap, right? Buxton is, could be severely underpaid for the foreseeable future if he plays well. Both the corner guys are young and controllable. Polanco is cheap and controllable, agreed to a cheap extension years also ago. Also rakes. Also rakes. <laughs> uh, Jeffers is cheap. Gar- Garver's cheap. Like, you've got a lot. Your whole offense is cheap. Like, spend a little bit on the uh, on the pitching side. And if you want to wait till next year, you can do that. But I think that's where we agree. I'm not going to take the Twins seriously if they don't spend on pitching by the end of next offseason. Right? Like, that, they have to do that. I'm watching. Like, but I like what I've seen, but they've got to do that. No matter how good some of these prospects look. I mean, we know that these, most of these prospects won't be ready till 2023. So I think you, this was like one of those where we're not making any major splashes. Cause I think you, you kind of hold and yeah. see, but then you can go from there. I do like your idea of Warnick though. Like if you have a team like the Yankees, like I said, again, or the Marlins, just cause those are two teams that we're familiar with and we know what they need. Like the Marlins are like, hey, we'll trade you, uh, you know, some interesting pitching prospects uh, to that are big league ready to potentially get Larnick. I mean, that that might be a situation where they're like, yeah, I guess we can do it. And then we'll put Kepler in the corner. And now what we about have about Eliezer exciting... Hernandez. Can yeah, like Eliezer Larnick? plus another, another pitching prospect. I'd do that in two seconds. You know, I'd do that in two seconds. So, well, the, the pitchers that... are out there. Thad Levine, Derek Falvey, you know what to do. You need a pitcher. You need pitchers. Hold on to that offense. Groom those young hitters. Bring up Woods Richardson and all those other prospects that you named. And we got a team here. Is it going to be in 2022? Probably not. 2023, 2024. There's a window there, Twins fans. We're going to get you there. Give us us the keys. We want the keys. We'll help. We'll do something. We'll We'll do something. We'll do something. When I saw that they had that much money uncommitted this year and still haven't done anything with these all these starting pitchers that have been available. And it's not like maybe with the shortstop market that we were seeing, maybe they thought if they needed a big time shortstop, they'd think to themselves, okay, we just got overpriced there. You haven't gotten overpriced out of some of these guys. Gosman, no, Ray. I, I would love, I would love to see them 
you know, call up Steve Cohen and be like, yo, how serious are you about spending? You want Josh Donaldson? Yep. They want a third, third baseman. Swap Josh Donaldson for J.D. Davis. Clear up the $42 million. Now you can actually get multiple pitchers. Yes. Or maybe they ask for a <laughs> Jared Eikhoff. Or a <laughs> It'll change it all. <laughs> Tyler McGill. Tyler. Tyler. Where, where did Tyler go? He went somewhere else. No, isn't he still a Met? Oh, is he still a Met? No, I saw him in a mock trade. <laughs> Someone threw McGill in there like that was going to put it over the top. Because I guess in the trade machine, he had like a little bit of value and it tied it up. I'm like, dude, you think Tyler McGill is going to make the difference? Also, though, wait, 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 before we wrap this up. They need to go get Tyler McGill. They would have the tallest rotation in baseball. McGill is 6'7", over 6'9". If they ever played pickup basketball with other rotations, they would clean. They'd mop the floor. But we just told them to sign Yusei Kikuchi, who is maybe 5'10". Is he just not tall? I don't think he's very tall. Well, what's, are you looking up Yusei <laughs> that, Kikuchi that... right now? I'm looking up Joe Ryan now. I, I want to see Joe Ryan's only six two. Damn it. Yeah, what's you say? I bet you you say he's listed at six foot. That's what all these guys do. That's okay. what I would do. I'm five eleven. I, I listen. Yeah, he's listed at six foot. No way. He's <laughs> There's no foot. shot. He's five ten. <laughs> he's five ten. Well, the, I mean, they can have an an absolute array of arms. You got six two. You know, we're building you guys a rotation based on height that will actually pitch the ball and be pretty good, but. That's the end of the playing GM with the twins episode, but tomorrow arms coming out with his top 10 twins prospects. So he's going to be talking a ton of prospects, but first in the link in our description in the podcast, we are selling these shirts, which I'm wearing for all of those on YouTube hashtag bigger than baseball. What we are doing is we are selling these shirts and in hopes to donate all the proceeds to the charities down there in Lexington, Kentucky. We've talked about this on previous podcast episodes, the tornadoes and the bad weather that has hit those Kentucky and those surrounding States. We want to give back. So we're donating all the proceeds from the shirt to those charities down in Lexington and those surrounding States, plus matching up to $500. So check out the link, get your shirt hashtag bigger than baseball. Some things are just bigger than baseball. It's kind of a phenomenal shirt. And you can find the rest of our merch there as well. The postseason shirt with pillbox and also just our general, just baseball merch, hoodies, hats, t-shirts. But in this time, we actually would prefer you buy the bigger than baseball shirt. Um, so we know that we're helping those people down there in need. Arm, you got anything else? Yeah, no, the only thing I was going to say is um, you know, I really appreciate our, our staff for kind of cluing us into this. We have a couple of people that, you know, either have family or live near the area of Kentucky and have really seen the devastation firsthand and, you know, just made it hit home a little bit more. When you're so far away from things, you don't really, it doesn't hit you as hard. I didn't even realize the gravity of it until, you know, I started looking, looking, at, looking at things and, you know, it was, it was really difficult. So while we can't change the world, uh, we want to try and do anything we can. And we appreciate everybody for helping us try to make even the smallest difference here uh, for what was you know, definitely just a horrible, horrible tragedy. Absolutely terrible. Well, thank you, everybody. And Dolphins, we'll see how they play tonight. Alvin Kamara, you better save me. You better save me, Alvin Kamara. I'm going to be so depressed for the prospects episode. I already know it. Well, that's it. And thank you, everybody.